Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 550 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me Please and Other Stories. Publishers Weekly says, Visceral settings and robust characters will have readers marveling at how much Kirtley is able to fit into a limited page count. For SFF fans with no time to sink into a doorstopper, these concentrated doses of genre goodness will hit the spot. And Kirkus Reviews writes, Kirtley employs sharp, concise prose that complements his puckish sense of humor. The author's passionate voice breathes life into this wonderful array of tales. So again, the book is called Save Me Please and Other Stories. And it's available now on Amazon.com. And our guest today is Abby Goldsmith, who you may remember from our panels on the books of Fire Upon the Deep and Ringworld, and the TV shows The Wheel of Time and Foundation. She's a co-host of the Stories for Nerds podcast, and her short fiction appears in magazines such as Fantastic Stories of the Imagination and Escape Pod, and in books such as Futuristic of Volume 2 and soon Four Chilling Tales. And in this interview, we'll be discussing her space opera novel, Majority, the first book in her six-volume Torth series. And now here's her interview with Abby Goldsmith. All right, so we're here with Abby Goldsmith. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Okay, so tell us about the Torth series. What's it about? So there's the Galactic Empire, and these people are all kind of neurally... Um, super luminally connected they can communicate instantaneously and they vote on everything so it's kind of mob rule taken to an extreme then the heroes um are victims of them and have to defeat them yeah so it's like an alien so, they're like aliens that control the whole galaxy basically the torth yes and then um in your um uh, sort of uh, promo email you sent out you say majority is like ender's game meets red rising so tell us yeah. about that. Yeah, well, okay, so I do have a young protagonist who is extremely smart, so I have kind of a little Ender Wigan vibe going on. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say he's got the same personality. It's definitely a different personality, but um, and he's disabled. So, that, I mean, my character is. So, yeah, the comparisons are there, um, but I think people that have read a little further into the series are going to say, no, nah, he's not Ender. Um. Mm. <laughs> but part of his thing is that he can telepathically absorb knowledge from anybody who's near him. So he just absorbs lifetimes of knowledge. If, if anyone's within a four yard radius of him, he absorbs their life memories. So he can, he's kind of helpless about it. He just can't help it. But, and the Torth empire, the, the mind readers, they have their own super geniuses. So he's not the only one who can do this. And some of the main, the major enemies in the series are other super geniuses that have that same ability. So there's the the um, Ender's Game vibe, and of course he's defeating an alien empire. Um, yeah, and then the Red Rising. It's it's also um, you've got a very oppressive kind of elite force going on, and I have a large group of characters. I mean, it's multi point of view. It's a large cast of characters. So. Thomas, the 13 year old super genius is not the ma- he's one of the main characters, but he's not the only character. Um, and so, yeah, I've got a gladiator named Ariok who is um, <laughs> he's got some mutations and he's got kind of a Superman. Uh, he's got a lot of power, basically. But again, he's not the only one. The Torth have their own versions of that. So, right. Yeah. So on on Amazon, the the book description it says that this is a dark sci-fi progression fantasy. So what is what does that mean? Yeah. Well, progression fantasy is kind of a somewhat new genre. I guess it's an old. It's a rebranding of an old genre. But it's heroic fiction. I mean, it's it's basically a a character that gains a lot of power within a system with very predefined limits and like a hard magic system basically um or a hard system of superpowers where you can tell the characters leveling up so my my series does have that um basically like like you know instead of like anything goes like gandalf um magic is whatever you want it to be like the magic is well defined like these are the limits <laughs> and 
the characters have to work within those parameters. Right. So you said online, this has a lot of overlap with superhero fiction and also with lit RPG, which yes. is, those are both terms that are new to me. So what is, what's the difference between progression fantasy and lit RPG? Well, lit RPG is full on, it's in a video game world. So usually what happens is a character gets transferred from our world into a game of some sort. Either they die and they're reborn, or it turns out the game world is the real world and our world is fake, you know, or something like that. And, um, and so, yeah, they're, they're basically gaining levels and, <laughs> you know, defeating NPCs and that sort of thing. So it's, it's like using game terminology, like the stats are a major part of those. So for your book, did, like if you had to run a tabletop RPG set in the Torith universe, do you know like the stats of the characters and like how they yeah. like how they level up? Yeah, they do, but it's it's not in a game framework. Like my, mine is not, so it's not like they have this much charisma and um, or, you know, or or this much um, I guess I'm trying to think of some different stats. Like you know, like, <laughs> like this, <laughs> like there's not like specific stats like that. It's more like within the magic system that I created, they are a fifth magnitude telepath and you know a, a sixth magnitude clairvoyant and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, so so talk more about the the Torith Empire. So we we explained that they're all telepaths, and um, but say a little bit more about their society. There's they don't work. Uh, there's no private property. Like, talk a little bit about about that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, unfortunately, it's a slave fueled economy. <laughs> unfortunately for the main characters. So, yeah, the Torth. They. I'm going to give a little bit of backstory, and this is not really shown in the first book so much. But the Torth started out as oppressed themselves. They were basically the non powered people in a in a on a planet where power people with powers ruled so they discovered science <laughs> um mostly from aliens and they they like basically integrated a lot of that and the taurus their ability is it's just telepathy they're all third magnitude telepaths every single one of them and that enables them to mentally network so it's like the internet on steroids and that ability has allowed them to basically conquer the galaxy. So they can, they're the perfect spies. They can choreograph anything. They cooperate fully. They're like a pack of wolves. There's no way to defeat them easily. It's like the Borg in Star Trek. So they do have individual personalities, but they are, um, they're dominated by the mob, basically. So whatever the mob wants, the mob gets. That's the majority. So the majority has outlawed all kinds of things. Like they've outlawed emotions, intense emotions, because they don't want to feel like if somebody panics in the middle of the mob, that can spread very quickly. So they don't want intense emotions in their society. So they've outlawed that. And by extension, you know, like a lot of like friendliness and that sort of thing is just out the window. So love doesn't exist. Um, so they're, they're all very like logical, like almost like Vulcans, but or that's the ideal anyway. Now they suppress their emotions and they, they have like devices that help them with that. Um, and yes, they consider anyone who's not a telepath who is not on their level there. That's an animal to them. And so they enslave them. And I guess we should explain, they look human because they were kind of taken from earth by aliens a long time ago and uplifted kind of. And so, I feel like yes. in a lot of science fiction, the aliens, there's aliens who basically look human. And I always appreciate it when there's some logical explanation for, for why that would be. A hundred percent. Yeah, I'm a I'm hundred percent. I also have non-humanoid or non-human looking aliens in my series, and they are some of the conquered people that the Torths have conquered. So there's plenty of aliens going on, but the Torths themselves look the most human, but they are the most alien mentally. Mm-hmm. So you, you yeah. said they're kind of like the Borg and kind of like Vulcans a little bit. So did you, is, is this sort of um, your response to some of the things that kind of bugged you watching Star Trek or? How did yeah. That <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's very true. I mean, I think in science fiction, there's always been like kind of a vibe that emotions are bad and having family and having friends is terrible. Um, so you see with the Jedi, like the Jedi Knights, it's like, oh, to be a good Jedi, you should reject family and friends basically. Um, you know, and again, like with, with Vulcans, it's like, oh, well, 
you know, we don't have sex or relationships. Maybe once every seven years we have an orgy and that's it. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, that's supposed to be a good thing. And yeah, so I was always like, eh, I don't see that leading anywhere good, personally. Mm-hmm. But I mean, there are up, sort of upsides to the the Torah civilization, right? Even Thomas sort of gets seduced by them. Thomas, the main character. And there's yes. even a part where he says, uh, as far as he was concerned, the Torah civilization was as close to perfection as a civilization could get. So there are some appealing things about it. Yeah, well, for sure, like superficially, it looks like utopia. I mean, they've absorbed all the knowledge in the known universe. Um, they've conquered every major civilization in the galaxy. So they they have all the technology. They've got all of it. So, yeah, I mean, Thomas is seduced by it because he had a lot of problems on Earth. He was in the foster care system. He had he he absorbed a lot of terrible things. I mean, he was living in foster care with other children that had terrible upbringings. And so to him, Earth wasn't all that great. Human society wasn't wasn't perfect in any way, shape or form. So when the Torth accept him. So for, for instance, like Thomas was always considered like, you know, he's a disabled child. So he didn't have much of a say in his own life. He was like shuffled around to different group homes. He didn't really get much respect just because of who he was. Now the Torth do not see any of that. They're like physical disability is nothing to them. So they don't even see it as far as they're concerned. He's a mental God. They see how intelligent he is. They see what, all the things that, that humans are unable to see right away. And so they're immediately just, they just value him completely. One of the other super geniuses mentors him and she's like, you are, um, you're one of us, <laughs> you know, and they respect him. He immediately gets like an audience of people that are respecting him, that value the things he can invent, the way he sees science and so he's yeah he's seduced by that for sure right and this this other super genius you mentioned is called the upward governess the torth don't have personal names they have sort of titles that they use to distinguish some of them and i really yes. love that name the upward governess do you remember how you came up with that or when you came up with that yeah i was i actually had some trouble with her but i mean yeah believe me i have a long list of name titles the <laughs> serendipitous day <laughs> the let's see like i've got so many um you know, the calamitous storm. There's so many different, but yeah, like it can be pretty difficult to come up with those. <laughs> the upward governess, um, it, it fits her personality. She's the governor of kind of a province. So she has a lot of authority and clout. And I originally had called her in, the indigo governess because she is an indigo blue rank, which is one of the highest ranks a tourist can achieve in the engineering field. But I just didn't want to be that on the nose with her. So upward is that she she advances very quickly. Um, she's risen in rank very quickly compared to most Torth. Mm -hmm. Another thing I thought was really interesting, you maybe mentioned a little of this earlier, is that the Torth, they don't want any individual to amass enough power that they could challenge the Torth society, yes. the Torth majority. So they've banned all sorts of things that, that might give individuals too much power. So they've banned superpowers, basically. Um, they allow a certain number of super geniuses, but they don't allow them to survive into adulthood. So they can't get too powerful. Uh, there's no genetic yeah. engineering. Uh, there's no AI and there's no faster than light, or at least it's, it's limited. So, um, and, and again, like, I always like that in science fiction where you're always kind of like, oh, why isn't everyone in the future? You're like, why isn't everyone all genetic engineered? Why is there no AI? And I always right. like it in stories like, like this or like Dune where there's some logical explanation for, for why that stuff hasn't happened. Yeah, exactly. I 100% agree. <laughs> mm. um, oh, I guess just one other thing I want to mention on, on the telepathy is that so the way that it's formatted in the text is that there will be these little parenthetical asides. Whenever the characters are communicating using the telepathic powers, there will be these little parenthetical asides throughout the text. So it says like, we parentheses, the Torth majority and parentheses. And I was just wondering um, where that came from or like at what stage in the process did you decide to to do that for the telepathy? Yeah, well, I wanted to give the impression of overlapping thoughts because they are a mob. So, yeah, um, I kind of have cascading overlapping thoughts going on with them if it's a whole bunch of Torth chiming in, which is the norm for them. 
um, an individual Torth might have something to say, but then a whole bunch of others will chorus. They have like a kind of a harmonious chorus. And so they'll, they'll all chime in if it's anything important. <laughs> so I, I wanted to just give the impression like to kind of clarify things that these overlapping thoughts kind of add a little bit of nuance to every conversation. Mm. Is telepathy a theme in science fiction that you're a big fan of? Like, are there a particular um, books or movies or anything that you really, that made you fall in love with the idea of telepathy? Well, honestly, like I have read a number of telepathy themed science fiction books, but I always feel like, ah, they're doing it wrong. Like this Mm. was kind of my take on like, here's how I want it done. Because I always, I always felt like some of the older versions of of telepathy, they kind of treated it like a cell phone, and to me, that's just scratching the surface of what it would really do. Yeah, because because you have other people reading your thoughts, and that gets makes makes life complicated very quickly. Well, we're seeing the beginnings of it with our internet, like you know, here in in the information age and the social media age, we we all see more and more what's happening. Um, you know, social media is not the best for mental health. We see kind of dog piles online and that sort of thing. And we're just at the beginning of, I think, an age of this. So I, I really wanted to explore that, like, like take it to its logical conclusion type of thing. Right. I mean, and, and you read the book and there's very clear parallels between this t- telepathic society and social media where people have, they're called orbiters, you know, people who are they're all sort of, as you said, they're all connected all the time, and but they kind of have to choose who to pay attention to at any moment. So the number of people who are, you know, paying attention to your thoughts as opposed to anyone else's or your orbiters. So it's kind of like your followers on, on yeah, Twitter or whatever. Yeah. The Taurus have like a literal attention economy. Like they don't even have money. They have, it's just about how many orbiters you have. The more you have, the the more stuff you can get. <laughs> and now I think, when did you start? Like when 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 did the first idea for the story start? Did you want uh, to write a novel about te- te- this like telepathic society that's um, oppressive and and all this stuff? Honestly, I mean, it's something that that I was kicking around in my head since like my teenage years and early twenties. Like, I grew up around when the internet was really starting to be a thing. Like, I guess most of us. Um, so yeah, like I saw all the potential in it. And I really wanted to write about it. Cause at least, I mean, my, my impression in the early days, you know, in like the nineties, early two thousands was that the internet was pretty cool, you know, like, and there were always crazy people on the internet, but they were sort of like their bad actions tended not to affect you if you just didn't pay attention to them. Um, and it wasn't until like Facebook and Twitter and stuff that all the toxicity started spilling off the internet into and affecting people's real lives and careers and reputations and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering, like, did you see all that coming or did you sort of like, um, you know, or did that influence, like, which, which way did the influence go? Did you sort of see it coming or did you see what was happening and that made you want to write about it? Honestly, I, I think I did see it coming at least a little bit. Like, so I had a friend in high school and we would go get on AOL chat and she would just lie to people, like straight up, like fool them. She'd be like, you know, like really manipulative. <laughs> and I would watch her do that. And it was very easy for her to sucker people in. And I was like, wow, you know, like lying is going to be a thing. <laughs> so, yeah, like I, I, I think I, I, there's just like a lot of things that, are kind of interesting, like a lot of social phenomenons that that I think we're still we're still just seeing the beginnings of it. Like so, mob rule, like like where everyone votes on everything. We don't even have that yet in our world, but I think it's going to come. I think we're going to see it at some point. Hmm. Um. I guess let's back up a little bit. So you said um, that I, I think this is on. Um, on John Scal, you, you wrote it was actually a really interesting piece. I'd encourage everyone to check it out on on whatever John Scalzi's blog about kind of how you about the origins of this Torth series. And so you said that when you were a kid, like I think a, a pretty little kid, you would sort of imagine that there was this audience of aliens inside your head, um, paying attention <laughs> yeah. to your to, to your daily life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you know, it, I think like everyone wants to be 
I, I'm not everyone, but a lot of people, they want to be famous. You know, every, a lot of people want success. They want to be admired for the things they're doing, you know, and uh, little kids more than anything want that. So I was a little kid, you know, I wanted attention and um, yeah, like, like you want praise, but then it's kind of like, if you're the victim of bullying, you don't want that kind of attention. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I was kind of the victim of bullying and in my mind, I was like, you know, this could if you're being watched by a bunch of aliens, you know, how involved are they really? Like, what are you to these aliens really? Like, you're not their child. You're, you're like just an object of their attention. And there's that, that layer of removal and it could lead to pretty dangerous things. Yeah. And, and then, so you just started writing, you were writing science fiction, right? From an early age specifically. Yeah, I was, I was writing um, all kinds of things. Yeah, even even at like age seven, eight, nine, I, I like banged out some crazy little a whole series of novels about animals, um, <laughs> anthropomorphic animals when I was like, you know, 11, 12. And I write I wrote a really early kind of crazy version of not th- what the Torth series eventually became, but kind of like a childish version. And <laughs> my mom sent it to Random House. She had she knew an editor there and she sent it in. And she didn't tell them I was a child. <laughs> and yeah, so that led to some crazy, like, we were in New York. And the editor was like, hey, you know, um, why don't you come up and visit our office? So uh, I came up and va- visited. And she looked at me and she goes, oh. And I was like, what? And she's like, oh, I didn't realize you were a child. And I was like, was well, that a problem? And, <laughs> and she said, uh, you shouldn't read the rejection letter I wrote you. <laughs> so yeah i still have that rejection letter it's pretty scathing but well, she said, basically assumed i was an adult yeah well yeah you, you said quote she, she wrote in her rejection letter quote it sounds like a mentally retarded person wrote this <laughs> yeah that was that would not be pc today uh this was <laughs> this was a while ago i this editor is likely very elderly or deceased at this point <laughs> but but that you said that just devastated you that you, that sort of uh, affected the course of your whole life that rejection letter. It did kind of yeah um, yeah. So at that point, I was like, well, I still have to tell stories, but I clearly can't be a writer. So I decided to become an animator and go into film. So yeah, um, I probably would have if I if that had see she actually sent a follow up letter saying i i would like to work with you you know we would love to to try now to that i know thing. that you're 12 years old right exactly um but i was just like no no it's it's too late um <laughs> <laughs> so so being you know i, I like a, you know the maturity level of a child in hindsight yeah as an adult you know that would have been an awesome opportunity to jump on but um yeah no at the time i was like well clearly i can't be a writer so I gave up on that whole path and I just, I wrote comic books underground at my school in high school. And I, my student films got into some international film festivals and then I ended up working in video games for about 12 years. So. Yeah. Let me, let me just add before we go on. I mean, just on the subject of rejections, like this is why people should not take rejections that seriously. Like, and I know if you're 12 years old, it's hard, you know, like everything it's like the, you know, it's like the first time, anything is happening to you. So it, it seems like such a big deal. But I had a, I had similar things, you know, where I think back and I'm like, why did I take this one thing so seriously? It's like such not a big deal, you know? And so I would just want to put that out for anyone who might be listening. Like, don't get one rejection or even a hundred rejections and, and take it that seriously, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um. But yeah, so you said uh, a lot of the inspiration for New Good Life, Water Garden City, and Umdokdol comes from the culture shock I experienced when I moved from a small town in New Hampshire to Los Angeles as a college freshman. So those are yeah. locations from the towards the from majority, if, if that's not clear. But so, so tell us about that uh, that culture shock. Yeah, I mean, I think anyone that's lived in like northern New England and then moved to like Southern California would feel this crazy culture shock. But I was also at a formative age going into college, so. Yeah, it's it's huge. It's a, the culture is very different. I mean, they're both in America, strangely enough, but it it does feel almost like a different country. So, it everything is different. You know, the weather, the people, the way you're treated, the demographics, the diversity there, the amount of ambition and what people are focused on. 
so, you know, like in New England, most of the people I knew were going to, um, they were going to become doctors and lawyers like their family, their family wanted them to become. Everyone who moved to Southern California to go into film school, <laughs> they were usually defying whatever their family wanted and they were going into entertainment. So just a completely different group of people and mindset. You know, like tradition is New England is very traditional. Uh, Southern California's tradition is out the window. So just the way people act and behave and all of that. And then, you know, yeah, on top of that, you're going from like kind of a a crazy like it's it's cold all the time in New England. It's winter for six months out of the year, and there's a lot of heavy snow. And then in New England, or sorry, in, in Southern California, it's a desert. I was living on the edge of the Mojave Desert. So, you know, it's just like it never rains there. When it rained, they would give out free soup to people, <laughs> <laughs> which, yeah. So I was kind of like blown away by that. When yeah. you, were, you were going to Cal Arts, which is a school, it was, right? This is it was founded by Walt Disney to train animators, like future animators for Disney. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, one of these days I'm going to write a magic school based on that. I just remember talking to you years ago. You were talking about like, I don't know, there would be some sort of party or something and everyone would just have these crazy like costumes. Like, because it's all art students, all these like just really out there, um, you know? Oh, yeah. Like one one interesting thing with CalArts is there's no censorship of any sort there. So you'd get some kind of mentally disturbed people coming to that school. You'd get a lot of like children of celebrities, like former child actors you know, people from very international people, like people from all over the world would go there or send their kids there. And there was anything went at CalArts. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so there'd be like student films that were just like, about like child molestation and very graphically so. Or yeah, like there'd be costumes where somebody would just be painted, they'd be wearing paint and nothing else. Um, Or like laying an egg or something. So <laughs> yep, like, like there was basically... um. <laughs> the sky was the limit there yeah and so, so did you like that that atmosphere or was it sort of uh uncomfortable no i i kind of liked it i was like some of it was really shocking but i kind of liked being shocked i guess <laughs> <laughs> i mean you can see like some of my favorite authors and artists and all that they're people that kind of go for shock value or try to like knock you off your sense of sensibility. You know, like, like I'm a fan of George R. R. Martin, people like that, Scott Sigler. <laughs> yeah. Well, me, me, I mean, George R. R. Martin is definitely one of my all time favorite writers. So, and you actually, so you went to the Odyssey fantasy writers, writers workshop because he was going to be there. Is that right? Yeah, I did. Yep. Yeah. And also that workshop is right near my parents' home there. So I was able to visit them and combine it with a visit. Uh, so say say more about Odyssey for people who who might not be familiar with it. Yeah, it's kind of like an intensive six week long workshop on a college campus where it's run by a former editor of Del Rey, and she invites authors, usually successful authors and editors, to show up for a week every week for about six weeks, and they will critique your work. It's a little limit with sixteen students. Now, I do know that nowadays it's online, and I think the limit is 12 students. So it's changed a little bit since then. Yeah. It's it's always online now? I think it is. Yeah, I, I think they stopped doing the in-person thing, which is too bad. The in-person thing was incredible. Yeah. I'll, I'll explain. I did Odyssey in 2001, and you did it in 2004. So, you know, just a couple years yeah. apart around the same time. Um, and actually, uh, regular listeners will know Andrea Kale. Uh, and she was in your Odyssey class. And actually, the reason I know you um, in the first place is because you and Andrea went to, to Odyssey together. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And it was a great year. I mean, you know, the, the year of George R. R. Martin, I, I would say like probably 70 or 80% of the students there were fans of him. And so this was before the HBO show came out. And when he got out of his taxi or whatever we all started cheering and we're like yeah george r, r. martin <laughs> and all the other students who were on campus were like what is wrong what are they <laughs> cheering for some old guy <laughs> i was actually the, you have a picture on facebook where it's uh was taken at odyssey and you're all kind of sitting around 
you know, on a lawn or something in chairs and, and George is sitting there and, and you say that in this conversation, he's actually telling you that the, that HBO has just picked up, um, you know, Game of Thrones to be a, a TV show. Yeah, yeah. And he comes from like a TV background. He was an executive producer in Hollywood. So it's sort of like, I mean, I think I knew and a lot of people knew that it was going to be a good show. And so you you say actually in um in majority you say uh further thanks go to Gene Cavellos and George R. R. Martin who gave me wonderful personal feedback and encouragement uh at the Odyssey Fantasy Writing Workshop. So what sort of feedback did they give you? Oh yeah. Like so my the I sent in an early prologue of my book. And I that prologue is scrapped now, so it doesn't show up in the book. Um and that was what got me into Odyssey. So Jean really liked it. She critiqued it. And then an early version of the first chapter, George R. R. Martin read that. And he thought it was a really cool, unique take on telepathy. And he he like went off talking about it for like probably 30 minutes. And I thought that was so cool, you know. 30, I was 30 like, oh, minutes. He went yeah, he he really wow. went off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you must have taken so you must have been really encouraged to get that sort of feedback, right? From these I big... was. I was really stoked, yeah. Yeah. And then, so then what happened uh, after that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, after that, I rewrote the entire book like two times from the ground up. Um, yeah, like, so I'll, I'll tell you, like, most authors, I think, would have just been like, all right, I'm throwing this out there. It's it's as good as it's going to get. But I, I have this thing where I just don't take failure well. Like, I just kind of refuse to give up. And that's honestly a detriment. I think I'm I'm working on trying to become less like that. But basically for me, like I was like, it has to be big five published or else, you know, nothing else is good enough. And so I was just fixated on that and I was not able to get an agent. They just weren't interested in it. Um, and I think that that will continue to be the case. Like in hindsight, I realize now it's like, the traditional publishing industry, the big five, they're looking for certain things. Um, and mine is not like the heroic fiction thing is not in trend right now with, with the big five, like period. So big epic, they want like a standalone with serious potential. And mine was not that it was never going to be that. And so, yeah, like what I have is a series and you know, again, like, like, it's not really about um, whatever they're looking for. It wasn't that. So. So, yeah, so, what, so what, what sort of efforts were you making to get it published at a big publisher? Like, were you querying and schmoozing and all that kind of stuff? All of it. I did everything. Yep. Yep. I went to like Worldcon, World Fantasy. I schmoozed with editors and agents. I got a full manuscript request from several. Um, you know, I queried at least a hundred agents and, you know, I, I did open calls. I like try to get feedback from industry experts and so on and so forth. Um, the beginning did have a lot of problems and a lot of the problems were like introducing my main characters where I've got a lot of trope subversion going on and people assume that you're playing the trope straight unless they read further into it. So I had a lot of people making kind of wrong assumptions based on the first chapter and so I, I was struggling with that. That's why I kept rewriting the beginning. Um, I eventually ended up going with a prologue that is not in Thomas's point of view. It's in someone else's point of view because his point of view <laughs> is too cynical. It was people were having trouble with it right off the bat. He's a favorite character with readers, but that like introducing him was just about impossible. Okay, so then. Um... Is is Wattpad? Is that sort of the next, next part yeah. of the story? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. So like around 2015, I, um, I got an offer from a small press, and I I was really having trouble. I was I was sitting in that thinking, do I really want to throw my Torth series to the small press, or should I just self publish it? And I I was like waffling back and forth. Um, I knew that the self publishing age had already the gold rush had already begun and i was like i should have done it two or three years ago and now that the, it's flooded so do i want to compete with that or should i even just try it online and see if i can get an audience that way because it would be much better to self-publish with an audience built in so 
Yeah, so I, I said no to that small press offer, and I, I started to serialize it on Wattpad, which at the time was a really great platform for serialization. And Do you, you want to just shows. explain, just if people don't know, just say a little bit more about what Wattpad is or what it was at the time? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I think that was founded around 2013 or 14, and it really started to, to gain. It, it got like 90 million users. It's an app, a mobile app. And so writers can just post on there. Readers can upvote the chapters and comment on them and it's international the one of the one of the big things about it is like there's a lot of countries where people don't have access to amazon they don't have access to amazon kindle unlimited and they don't have libraries so it wattpad took off hugely in like the philippines and like a few other countries but it was it became a very international giant platform for writers and it did start to skew more and more towards romance, um, like spicy romance. And a lot of that was like kids reading stuff they shouldn't have been reading behind their parents' backs, right? Like like erotica, <laughs> basically. Exactly, right. Yeah. So so it became very popular with young kids and like teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure they were like, oh, you know, racy werewolf romance or billionaire werewolves in space or whatever. And they were reading that and their parents had no idea. But you became one of their like a Wattpad star, right? Like you were one of the, you were you were doing really well on Wattpad. Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Like, like I did start to build an audience. I was releasing like a chapter every what, two chapters per week for years and years and years. And Wattpad is not because really you had. Let me just explain because you had written like four or five books in the series. At yeah. This point. Yeah. So you had a ton of material that you could release. You had enough that you could release weekly or twice a week for for years. For like yeah, years exactly. Yeah, that's that's the funny thing. I was sitting there like, well, I mean, I have 300 chapters. You know, <laughs> if I release a chapter every week, I could be doing this for a long time. Um, but then what was funny? But so is let me just let me just stop. so so you'd written like like four or five books without the first one being released in any way. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I had some beta readers that were enjoying it and my husband was enjoying it, you know, so I knew that I knew that some people would like it. Um and I wanted to try it to a, like, you know, the internet at large, so why not? And but I I was not I was writing it kind of like at a slow pace, like, oh, you know, we'll see. We'll see where this goes. And when it started to take off on Wattpad, I actually realized that I needed to finish the whole series quickly because um, they were going to get to the end qu like sooner than I thought. Like I was sitting around like, oh, yeah, I have plenty of time. And then, you know, they're like, more, send more. I was hmm. like, okay, I'll, I'll speed it up to, you know, two or three chapters a week. So I, I think I was doing three chapters a week at one point. And then I was like realizing, well, I'm already on book four here and I haven't written book six or seven. <laughs> <laughs> so I better get cracking. Um so yeah, it did kind of motivate me to finish the whole series. The comments were awesome. I still have like a lot of fans from that site. Yeah. And then what is Royal Road is a similar thing that you also posted it on? Yeah. So I relaunched the entire series on Royal Road. And part of the reason was like Wattpad has kind of lost a lot of the, the discoverability features that made it so great. Um, I noticed that like I, I still had the same readership, but nobody knew was coming in. So <laughs> I was like, all right, like, and I, I've heard that from a lot of Wattpad authors as well. Like, like people that had a million reads on their series were unable to get anyone to notice their next book. So I was like, all right, discoverability is utterly broke broken on this platform. And meanwhile, I'm hearing all kinds of crazy stories from Royal Road of authors that like, gain a million fans overnight type of thing. So I was like, you know, I, I knew I full on new writers that were earning a full time living on Patreon from advanced chapters from Royal Road. So I was like, well, I absolutely have to try Royal, Royal Road. There's no no question. It had been on my radar for years. I'd heard it recommended to me even by some readers, but I always kind of dismissed it, like going, ah, oh, it's a silly website. I don't know. I was wrong to dismiss it. It was a good. It's a good site. <laughs> You say in the acknowledgments, I'm grateful to my readers on Royal Road as well, especially the ones who fought back on semi-abusive comments. Yeah. What's the, story? What's the story there? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So here's the thing. The demographic on Royal Road, a lot of these people are 
unfiltered 14 year old boys. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all over the world, you know, but it is mostly U S and Canada and yeah, they'll say what's on their mind. So, and, and a lot of them are kind of like, yeah, they're a little crazy, a little abusive. Um, so for instance, like, so my main character, Thomas undergoes a lot of crap. Like he, he's coerced into doing horrible things. Like, his life isn't great. He doesn't have easy wins. And so I had a bunch of readers, usually like, like that demographic, that were just like, he should go full murder hobo and murder everyone. Why isn't he murdering everyone? You know, I, this play, this story sucks. I hate how he, he's not like evil. Why won't he just like murder? You know, and then the be one character or something would be kind of mean to him and say like, I don't trust you anymore. And they'd be like, she should be raped and murdered and brutally, brutally like tortured to death for saying that to him. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, and this is out. why direct democracy is a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I don't want to, like, be mean to my readers. So I don't want to say anything. But, yeah, there were other people in the comments that would be like, wow, you know, chill out. Like, like I don't think this character deserves to be, like, raped and tortured for saying a slightly mean thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just explain, too. You know, um, this this first book it's it's sort of a harrowing story because you know just by the nature of the logic of the situation thomas is in this you know sinister totalitarian society where everyone can read his mind at almost all times and this has profoundly damaging psychological effects on him and you know affects his character and everything so you know the, the just the logic of the situation is you have to explore some of that stuff yeah, that's exactly it. And I'm kind of like, I know that, that first book does have some problems, but I'm kind of glad in some ways because it filters out to the readers that can't handle it. Like there's <laughs> readers that, that get that and they're just like, oh, it's too brutal. You know, they what they want is ponies and rainbows. And my book isn't that. <laughs> Definitely not. So so tell us what sort of, um aside from just the... Or, or, yeah, what, what sort of benefits did you get from from Wattpad and Royal Road? Like, how did that um, uh, affect your career or impact your career? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, for one thing, I think just having a readership and a really engaged, really supportive readership really helped me finish the series. It motivated me. Like, it's one thing to have friends and family being supportive and, you know, like an odd beta reader here and there. But like to have like this large group of people that are all in it together and like every chapter they're showing up and like having kind of fun fandom moments. Somebody like wrote some fan fiction for it and, um, you know, that sort of thing. So that's a lot of fun. And it's really motivating. Yeah. And then, I mean, of course, like getting a publication deal. So there's a number of publishers that watch Royal Road. They see who's up getting up on the rising stars list. And when my series hit, like a number four on the rising stars list, I got an offer, a really good offer from podium. Yeah. So yeah. tell us about podium. Cause they're, they're sort of a new company that got big with audiobooks, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm an audiobook listener. I love audiobooks and podium is one of the big ones. Um, you know, Tantor and sound booth. There's a few others and a lot of them are actually watching Royal road and seeing success stories there and snatching them up. And that happened because of Wattpad and like, do you think, that ever would have happened if you hadn't posted the the stuff on on those sites? Yeah, not absolutely not. I mean, on Royal Road in particular, like Wattpad isn't being watched that way. Um, in a, a, one of the reasons is because Wattpad is mostly romance, and so there's like a whole separate track for romance going on. But for sci-fi, fantasy, heroic fiction, lit RPG, progression fantasy, all of that. Um, isekai and that sort of thing like anything inspired by japanese light novels or manga you're seeing a lot of that in royal road and there's a there is a large audience for that and so podium they bought the whole series like they're, they're releasing the whole was it six book series yeah they are um yeah they're coming out every four months and it's really awesome yeah so i was planning to self-publish like i i had no I, I like. I was definitely planning to self-publish. Like Royal Road was the relaunch to see if I could get more of an audience, which it, I did. And then after that, I was planning to to start publishing it on Amazon. And the offer from Podium was kind of unexpected and awesome, and so I, I took that. And they're also they're doing an audiobook, 
uh, as well, right? Yes. Yeah, they hired George Newbern. Um, he he read A Man Called Ove and Other Land by Tad Williams and a few others. Yeah, yeah so that's just... He's been the voice of Superman. <laughs> <laughs> So that's just really cool. I mean, one, um, one com and, um, you know, so this is like a six book series. It's 1.1 million words. So like, like 11, like average size novels, basically. I mean, it's just a gigantic undertaking that you've been working on for 20 years or so. And so it's just, you know, a huge accomplishment, a huge, you know, amount of effort. So the, the comment that really, when you, when you announced your pub publishing deal, the comment that really stuck in my mind is is someone in the comments said, um, nobody deserves it more than Abby. And I, I totally agree with that. I mean, this is, you know, you've uh, <laughs> you've earned this, uh, the success, uh, you know, in a way that, you. Uh, you know, I don't know that anyone has worked harder than you have uh, at their writing that I know. Thanks. Yeah. Well, part of that, I think, is a little bit of insanity. I, I don't recommend <laughs> other people do it this way. Like it, it was... Um, in hindsight, you know, I, I've said this before, like I wish I had self-published in 2010 or 2011 um, before the gold rush really got underway. That would have been a perfect time to do it. And I knew it at the time, but I was so st like stuck on a big five deal. I, I refused to see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was when sort of like Hugh Howey and right. Andy Weir, is that the sort of that time period? It was. Yeah. Yep. I watched their careers take off and I was like, I should really do that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? And it's like it's really hard to know, you know, like, I, I guess if you know, like, like I think a lot of us, you know, you're just sort of attached. You know, you grow up reading books from Tor and whatever, and you're just like, that's what I, that's what I want to do, and it can be hard to to let go of that, uh, that idea. Yeah, that was exactly it. Yep. Um. But now the whole series is done. Uh. This is sort of a uh. You know, a nice thing that people can start reading the series and and know that there is a conclusion. Um, and I thought one thing you said that was kind of cool is that you know the, because you have these characters who are super geniuses, the fact that you're not releasing that you've written the whole thing, you know how it ends, you know everything that happens, you can go back to the earlier books and make sure that everything the characters do is is smart and prescient, and in a way that you wouldn't be able to do if you were writing the books oh, and publishing yeah. them. Oh yeah, like I I want to say like. Having the whole series pre-written, I think, in a lot of ways, is a superpower. You know, I've noticed, like, Michael J. Sullivan with his Rayera series, he did that as well. And the series he wrote is very cohesive for that reason. You know, I, I think a lot of series authors, they get, they start to, like, meander or lose the thread if they are publishing as they go. You see that a lot with series authors. Yeah, it'll dwindle into stats and melee battles, or they'll just not finish the series, or they'll end it all with like a giant tragic accident where, where everyone dies. Um, and yeah, with mine, I was able to avoid all of that. Like, I had instincts to end it kind of tragically, and I was talked out of it by readers, and I'm glad they talked me out of it. So, yeah, and, and also, yeah, very much with the super geniuses, like, I was able to go back and make sure that those super geniuses were on top <laughs> of things. So they do come across as smart, you know, like, like they always know what's about to happen. Yeah. I always, I mean, I heard George R. R. Martin say one time that he was in a writer's group with Gene Wolfe when Gene Wolfe was writing the book of the new son and that Gene Wolfe wrote the whole series before any of the books were published. Um, so he, you know, he could go, he could put stuff in the first book that, you know, set up stuff in the fourth book that he wouldn't have necessarily thought of if he were again, publishing them one after the other. So that is definitely, you know, obviously it's, you know, not everybody can, uh, can do that, but yeah, it just seems like there's such a huge advantage to, to, to being able to, uh, tweak the whole story once you have, once you know how it ends. I think there is like, I'm, I'm actually considering trying that again, but I am not sure I have enough years in my lifetime to do, <laughs> to do yeah. Like, I, I don't think I'm going to spend 20 years on something again, but I might, try to pre-write like at least three or four books before I do another, like I, I have another series I'm working on and I would like to try that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So talk a little bit about, it's kind of interesting, you know, so we, we mentioned that there's this clear, um, sort of par clear, clear parallels between the Torth and um, dog pile mobs on Twitter and Reddit and stuff like that. And that contrasts a little bit with uh, some of these aliens, the Umans and the Nushans. 
um, they have the they have a different philosophy. Um, so there's something called the Code of Guat. So, yeah. So what is the Code of Guat? Um, it's about seeking knowledge and never assuming you're right about anything. So these the Ummans, the Nusians, the other aliens, they are all under the thumb of the Torth Empire. They're all slaves. They've been conquered. They're, they had great civilizations and they've been conquered. And so, you know, as far as they're concerned, like the Torth are gods to them and the Torth know everything. The Torth always know what they're thinking, what they're planning, what they're about to do. So in contrast, those who follow the path of Gwat, they are... Um, they they don't know anything like they are not torth the the whole point is that they don't know and so it they kind of embrace the fact that they always have to seek knowledge instead of being handed it, it being handed to them mhm there's a part where where um the character kessa she says i cannot read minds so i should refrain from judging people the only person i have a right to judge is myself and i feel like like 99% of internet discourse is people attributing sinister motor malicious motives to people that they disagree with. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I just feel like, you know, and most of the time what's actually at issue is some empirical question that ought to be and could be resolved by reference to data, you know, and, and stuff and, and, and nobody ever, you know, and, and that just gets lost in this discussion of what's of how, how evil um, the opponents are. And I just feel like what other people's motives are is like, a, the thing that we have the least insight into as human beings, and B, is usually irrelevant anyway. If somebody's saying something true, it doesn't really matter that much if, they're, if they have bad motives. And if they're saying something that's not true, it doesn't really matter that much if they have good motives. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, one of the three core tenets of Guat is that certainty is not the same as truth. I don't think it's said in the book what the other two core tenets are. Do you have those? Do you have uh, those handy? I don't have them handy, but I did write write them out somewhere. <laughs> 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 I think it was a post on Patreon. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the the Nushans, uh, two things we hear about their philosophy, uh, two sort of uh, wise sayings are, those who make no effort to understand their enemies become enemies themselves, and knowledge is worth pain. Uh, any uh, Any thoughts about that? Nushan philosophy yeah i mean um yeah i mean that that's kind of like they're they do follow guat and that's kind of what a good nushan would say or or think of course there's always bad nushans <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, yeah i mean but yeah like they try to be non-judgmental it, it's kind of it, it's basically their version of guat so yeah so so yeah i, I just feel like yeah that this is there's an awesome um you know like superpowers and, you know, space opera battles, telepaths, you know, uh, mutant super geniuses. There's all that stuff. But then there's also this really good social commentary and, you know, satire and, and critique of all this stuff. And so I think that's something that, that you do really well in this series is, uh, you know, balancing those two, you know, those two aspects of it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I, I go really far into um, the whole like themes of slavery and oppression versus freedom, um, and the different versions of freedom later in the series. But book one is is mostly about them trying to escape the Torth Empire. Uh huh. Yeah. Um. All right. So, uh, so what are your plans now? Uh, now that the uh, the Torth series is uh, is coming out and is complete and stuff, what are you uh, what are you working on now? Well, I'm doing another giant series, and here's the thing: like a lot of authors, I think, are kind of feeling pressure to um, obey genre tropes, right to market, and do the popular thing. And I probably should follow the herd, but I never do. I, I, I'm just not going to. So, yeah, my next series is going to be weird. It's going to be more social commentary. This time, a little bit on uh, a little bit of a commentary on a lot of the broken failing systems that we see in America um, with healthcare in particular. Uh, yes, yeah, so you said it's going to be epic fantasy. You said my next huge project is an epic fantasy in a world where magical spells drain life force. The peasants can't guess why costs are skyrocketing. So yeah. So, so yeah, it is a sort of epic fantasy kind of uh, medieval society kind of thing. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, there's gonna have some like overtones of of ancient Greece and a little bit of like Viking era kind of stuff going on. But yeah, I have a very, very hard magic system where I've I've really outlined it quite a lot and that is integral to the plot. Yeah. So how uh well how how soon do you think you might release anything, any of that? No idea. I'm I'm not <laughs> the fastest writer. Um when I get going, I get going fast, but I have put a lot on hold to try to promote book one of Torth. So I, I'm i actually going to get re- back to writing pretty soon, though. Uh, so so what's, yeah. what sort of promotional efforts uh, have you been doing? Just a lot of outreach to influencers and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're friends on Facebook, so I see like it's, you're like posting on all these uh, – uh, science fiction and fantasy uh, Facebook groups that I never even heard of. Like every like every day, there's a there's a, a post from Abby. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I know how it is. Um, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm definitely trying everything. Like I would, I really do want it to take off, but it's difficult. And maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree on some of it. So I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm I'm not a natural marketer. Mm. No, I, I appreciate the hustle. I, I I'm I like that. You know, so. <laughs> I hope it. I hope uh, people will will check out the books. Uh, you know, because like yeah, like you've put so much uh, so much of yourself into them. Thanks. Um, and then also you say uh, I also want to sell my standalone techno thriller that touches on Chat GPT issues. Yeah, yeah, that one. That one's a little crazy. I, I actually, yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to try querying agents with that one because it might hit with the big five. I don't know. Um, although again, like it might be dancing too close to like controversial issues in real life that nobody wants to touch. So, (laughs) um, you know, there's a lot of controversy about using AI in the arts and I'm in, I'm in the controversy as well. Yep. Uh, so, so sorry. in, In what sense does the, does the novel involve like AI? Well, okay. So it takes place a little bit in the future and, um, you know, so AI is being used everywhere. There's chatbots everywhere. And there's kind of like, you know, an evil corporation, of course, <laughs> that is um, kind of enslaving people in vats and causing and forcing them to act as human chat GPT. So they're replacing because they found that like it's more cost effective to use humans instead of because humans are, are just all around more dynamic and smarter than chat GPT. So but you know they want them as slaves they want it to cost nothing for them so the humans are kind of being forced to do that and they earn gold coins and whatnot it's like a video game so is this i heard you say one at one point that you had a trunk novel that was like influenced by your um years working in the video game industry is that this or is that something different no or no is that I actually to this? this one is a little bit related because the main character is a 3d animator working in games and that that was me. So she's very, very closely based on me, which a little too close for comfort kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but but yeah, no, I also wrote kind of like a memoir about my time in the video games. I'm not sure what to do with it yet. I'll, I'll figure it out, but I'm not sure I'm going to post it anywhere. Mm. So what is like what is kind of the what was the ta- like sort of one sentence takeaway from your time in video games or like what is the kind of the, the thrust of the memoir? um i mean the arts are hard i don't know Hmm. (laughs) um things are not as it's not as glamorous a job as you would expect uh and i guess to like dispel some of the myths about it like there's definitely a lot of i think myth mythologizing going on in the in the world i see like i actually wrote an article that was published in um what's called putting the science in fiction and the article is called CGI is not made by machines, which that's one of those things. Like I see it a lot with other authors. They'll, they'll like write about virtual reality or games as if like the stuff is created by out of the other. It just, it just comes into being. And I like usually the, the role of artists and programmers is downplayed to the point of ridiculousness. So, you know, I, I would like to dispel some of those myths the stuff isn't created by magic. 
Yeah, I mean, for this podcast, I've interviewed a bunch of people about, you know, about memoirs, about working in the video game industry and stuff. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I think a lot of us, you know, we grow up just loving video games and being like, oh, I'd love to work on my favorite video game. And then the reality of the of working in an industry is uh, is sort of not what we imagine. So you just sort of want to be uh, aware of that before you, you know, before you get a before you go into that field. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I feel like my life would have been a little better if I'd gotten a good reality check before I went into games and that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Grew, being a kid growing up obsessed with fantasy and science fiction is not necessarily the best for having a uh, comprehensive picture of the realities of uh, life on planet Earth. Right. Exactly. You know, I, I grew up like during the golden era of Disney. So when they had the Little Mermaid came out and all that, and I wrote to Disney as as like a fifteen year old, how can I work for you? And they sent back a list of all the colleges I should go to, and I was like, all right, number one on the list is Cal Arts. I'm going there. <laughs> and you know, and I just had this like rosy idea that I would work for Disney and then Pixar, and I would like, you know, work my way up and become a director, and I'd live in a mansion, and you know, I'd be like directing awesome animated films. You know, but of course, none of it's, it just isn't that easy. <laughs> yeah. Did, did they lay off the whole animation department like the year you graduated or something like that? <laughs> they, they did. Yeah. 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 That was, that was funny. Like the year before I graduated, there was a job fair and I got an offer from LucasArts and they were like, we'll pay you like 50,000 a year to start and you can work on the new Star Wars films. And I was like, nah, I'm going to finish my, my school. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, I'm sure it'll be easy to get a job. No problem. Um, and yeah, like like then the very next year, Disney laid off 800 feature film animators. <laughs> and the industry was flooded with those people. And so, yeah, like like students like me didn't have a chance. It was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like an interesting story. So if that uh, if that memoir ever sees the light of day, I'd be curious to, to, to find out more. Yeah. Um, well, my only hesitation is like people might recognize themselves in it you know even if i change the names the circumstances are really unique to everything yeah yeah well maybe the torth series will become a huge bestseller and then you'll have so much money you don't even care you're just like yeah <laughs> then you'll just put out your memoir yeah yeah well i've, I've considered posting it on the down low on wattpad <laughs> or something um all right so we're pretty much out of time um do you have any other uh any other projects or, or anything articles short stories or anything you want to mention um not really no i mean i'm i've got a few short stories out there that are making the rounds but i might just end up offering them as freebies on patreon or something or my newsletter mm -hmm. are you still doing stories for nerds is that still going i am yeah yep that is a bi-monthly podcast and it's sort of it's sort of like would appeal to Geek's Guide to the Galaxy listeners, right? You talk about books and movies and TV yeah. shows and stuff. Yeah, for sure. It's three of us. So we have it's three co it's I'm one of the co hosts and we discuss like film, TV, um, games and manga and that sort of thing. Um and a little bit of our own pro about our own projects. So yeah, I mean it, but it's very much conversation style, it's not really interview style. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, all right, cool. So yeah, so that all sounds great. And so I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Abby Goldsmith about her new book, Majority. So Abby, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on the show. And that was her interview. So big thanks again to Abby Goldsmith for joining us on the show. This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell 
no one. Thank you for listening.